Good morning, my friends. It's good to be together again on this Sunday, August 23rd, year 2020, the 12th Sunday after Pentecost, the 24th Sunday in unordinary time. We may be uh, apart physically as we worship, but let us remember that we are certainly not apart as a community of faith uh, spiritually. We are connected um, body, mind, and soul through our Lord Jesus Christ. So in the midst of the pandemic and uh, this living apart, continue to find joy in your heart because it is there. Continue to look for the glimpses of God as God will continue to surprise you and me in a myriad of different ways. Uh, continue to be hopeful, my friends. We'll get through this um, and let's continue to get through this healthy um, and sane. Let's go to worship together. My friends, welcome to the worship of God at Wallingford Presbyterian Church. I'm glad that you found us, and I'm glad that you've chosen to spend uh, an hour or so uh, with us uh, as we join together in mind and spirit and albeit not in body. But let us worship together with joy and thanksgiving in our hearts. Let's go to church. As we begin worship together, I'd like to use the words of Anne Weems to gather our hearts and minds. She writes, I've never understood those who say they don't need the church. Mine is a profound need to worship and to live in solidarity with a community of the faithful. Of course, I can pray by myself and make decisions by myself. But it has to be in the context of the covenant that you and I have with God. To love mercy in the midst of the unmerciful. To do justice in the jaws of injustice. To be humbly aware of God's grace takes constant communion with God and the community. To me, being faithful assumes life in this community, which Christ called his church. To me, the church is home. I'll ask Mina Varney now to lead us in our call to worship. Friends in Christ, please join me in our call to worship. We gather as a human community, ordinary in all things, yet extraordinary in this. In God's spirit, we become the body of Christ. We are tradespeople and artisans, teachers and lawyers, board members and directors, gardeners and health workers, parents, children, siblings, spouses, and partners on the journey of faith. In God's spirit, we become the body of Christ. We bring a variety of expressions, ethnicities, traditions, orientations, backgrounds. In God's spirit, we become the body of Christ. We delight in one another, work together, disagree at times, and support each other always. In God's spirit, we become the body of Christ. Let us worship God. Thank you. 
confession this morning is taken from Paul's letter to the Christian church in Ephesus. Paul's words strike at the heart of what it means to live in community with one another. We begin our confession by singing verse 1 of hymn 729, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian. away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Lord, I want to be talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful in building up as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with malice and be kind to one another tender-hearted forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you God in Christ has forgiven us. Thanks be to God. Let us be imitators of God in what we say, in what we do, in, what, in who we are. Amen. Good morning, children. How are you doing today? Well, I wanted to start off by asking you a question. What do you get mad about? Now, we all get mad, right? And that's why I didn't ask the question, do you ever feel angry? Because we all feel angry, right? Sometimes we get upset, we get mad, and it could be for many different reasons. It could be that maybe we didn't get what we wanted, or maybe um, someone was mean to us and it felt unfair. Uh, there's, there's lots of reasons we could be mad, but why do you get mad? Yeah, I understand that feeling. I've been mad too. Let's look at this picture. This is from, we're not learning the Easter story today, but this is a little book about the Easter story. This person, he's feeling mad too, right? How do we know that? Okay, his face, maybe his face looks a little upset, a little bit of a frown. His eyebrows look a little upset. <laughs> and he maybe has a clenched fist, right? Mm. These are things that 
uh, you know, we feel when we're mad. We get upset, right? Well, our scripture for today is telling us that, uh, you know, we do all get mad. It acknowledges that. It, it, and, you know, what we have to remember from this scripture is uh, that God wants us to put away our anger. A great part of the scripture says, um, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Hmm. It's a little hard to understand, right? Well, I'm outside today. And one of the reasons is uh, that the sun is shining out here. But eventually what happens um, a little bit after dinner time, the sun goes down, right? And it becomes dark. And so what the scripture is saying is don't let the sun go down on your anger, meaning don't be still angry when you go to bed. Um, because holding on to that anger uh, really hurts us and it hurts the people that we're mad at, right? But to forgive, to let go of that anger is the best thing for us. And that's what God wants for us. Um, so to remember this week, if there's any time where you feel upset, you feel angry at someone um, and you see the light coming in through the window, Maybe you can remember with me, uh, do not let the sun go down on your anger or don't go to bed angry, right? Do whatever it takes. Maybe um, talk to your parents about it or your brother and sister if um, they're the ones who upset you. Um, and and think about how that's what God wants for us, um, not necessarily to be angry. We can put that away um, and it's okay to feel angry. These are feelings that are natural, but to not hang on to that forever because that hurts our hearts, right? And God wants something better for us. So uh, instead, I have a nice picture in here too. This is the end of the Easter story. So, but it's it's still a good reminder. Easter is always uh, with us. But what does this girl look like? She looks pretty happy, right? She looks peaceful. And she's enjoying her day with some flowers and her friends, right? And I'm sure this little girl, she might have been upset at her friends before, right? But it's still sunny out. She's not letting the sun go down on her anger. So let's remember that this week. If there is a time that you get upset, that's okay. If you get angry, that's okay. Um, but try to uh, resolve that or try to... Um, Make up with your brother or sister or um, talk to your parents about it or pray about it um, because God wants us to let go of that and instead welcome that peace and that joy back into our hearts because that's what's good for us, right? To feel this way. Okay, well, thank you for joining me today, children. Let's close in prayer. If you could echo after me. Dear God, we know that it's okay to be angry sometimes, but help us to remember to not let the sun go down on our anger. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining me. See you next time. Bye.
Friends, please join me in our prayer for illumination. God of revelation, mere flesh and blood cannot reveal divine truth. Only your spirit can give that gift. Be in my breath and voice, be in our ears and understanding, that through these words, your word may be known. Amen. Today's scripture comes from the letter to the Ephesians, and I read from chapter 4 and various verses throughout chapter 4 and chapter 5. Let us listen for the word of God. So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. As you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times, and do everything in the name of of the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless to our understanding this reading from Holy Scripture. Friends, please pray with me. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Today I want to continue our talk about life being messy. It's a talk that we started last week. And maybe how we can clean it up a bit, clean up a bit of that messiness by living in an intentional Christian community as we are called to do. Paul writes to the Ephesians, well, Actually, not Paul, probably someone else, the scholars say, but a writer very familiar with Paul's writings and Paul's theology, who admired Paul so much as to put Paul's name on the letter. Not an uncommon thing to do at the time, but maybe more a topic for Bible study. In any case, he writes to the Christian community in Ephesus and really to all Christian communities everywhere. Blessed be the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ according to the good pleasure of his will. In him we have redemption according to the riches of his grace that he has lavished on us. That is to say, that they are a community, 
as we are a community because of our being rooted in Christ, because of God's grace for us through Jesus Christ. The first part of the letter is really about making that point abundantly clear to his readers. The second part of the letter is all about making all those theological understandings take flesh in our everyday life while living in community with one another and the world. He writes, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. So, how are we to flesh out our faith in Jesus Christ? How are we to live out our faith? How are we to live in community with one another? Whether that community be comprised of two or 25 or 125 or 425 or fill in the blank. Well, as Christians, we live in community by first realizing that we are one with Christ, and that through Christ we belong to one another. That's not as easy as it sounds. Paul mentions in the letter that we are all part of a whole, that we need each other much like our physical body needs all of the parts to be whole and to promote growth. But, you know, that means saying no to what I want sometimes and saying yes to you for the sake of the growth of the body. And then there's this whole mention of speaking the truth in love. And I love what Jamie Clark Souls has to say. Dr. Souls, Clark Souls is Associate Professor of New Testament at the Perkins School of Theology at Southern Methodist University, and she writes, Let everyone speak the truth with their neighbor. Why would we risk such a thing? It is not polite behavior. It is a huge investment of time, and it is potentially troubling. The author of Ephesians insists that we need to speak truth because we actually are all part of one another. Not speaking truth to each other is tantamount to not speaking truth to ourselves. Without truth, authentic community fails. Not speaking truth to ourselves. You know, when two people have a disagreement in the life of the church, and one of them comes to me to express their concern, the first thing I always ask is for them to sit with me and with the person with which they have an issue. The same holds true when people are having difficulties in their marriage or in any other relationship. I ask that they be willing to talk with each other about what is troubling them. Do you know how often that takes place? that people will actually sit down and talk to each other about what is troubling them? Unfortunately, not very often, I'm sad to say. I've had people leave the church rather than speak to the other person. I've had people leave their marriage. People lift long-time relationship with friends. And I think that's because we are all pretty good about wanting to speak the truth, but not so good and not so hot on doing so in love. Why? Because the first part of the sentence without the second part of the sentence is just me talking and making it all about me. But when you add in love... Well then, what makes you vulnerable to the other and them to you? You don't just talk when you speak in love. You also have to listen. I want to say that again. 
But when you add in love, then that makes you vulnerable to the other and them to you. You don't just talk when you speak in love. You also have to listen. And that usually means taking a good look at yourself and why you are talking in the first place. Paul continues, put away from all, put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, forgiving one another as God has forgiven you. And then this, be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. We imitate God by loving sacrificially. You see, you don't just live for yourself. (laughs) Just put the mask on and keep others safe. Is it really that hard to do? I ask myself when I watch the television and all these people making such a fuss about wearing a mask. Is it that inconvenient, that much of a compromise to do something for the good of the other? The letter then continues, be careful how you live, making the most of the time. Don't be foolish and waste your time on foolish things, but understand what the will of the Lord is. What do you think the will of the Lord is? I think sometimes We have a hard time speaking the truth in love to one another because we confuse the will of the Lord with the rules of the Lord. Sometimes we use the rules to differentiate us from them. But in God's will, we are them. And they are us. For me, the will of the Lord is God's reality for the world, a a vision of hope and peace, a movement forward toward that end by all of creation. For me, as I understand it, the will of God is expressed in the words of the prophet Micah in chapter 6. He has told you, immortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with our God. Or again from the prophet Isaiah, as read by Jesus in the synagogue in Nazareth in Luke 4. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. So to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And the words of Jesus in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, Love one another as I have loved you. Could it be any more simple than that? Or any any more difficult to do? Or stated simply in 1 John, God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God. I'm pretty sure that that's the will of the Lord. The rules of the Lord are those things we need to address the reality of our troubled and destructive world and our total depravity, as Calvin put it. That's where the commandments come in to help keep us on the right path, moving forward, moving toward wholeness. But the rules are different than the will. Even Jesus had trouble with people confusing the rules of God with the will of God. See what he says about the Sabbath sometime. Friends, when we make the rules the same as the will of God, we create a rigidity never meant to bind the love of God. We make the rules God, and that is idolatry, and actually breaks the first of the ten rules or commandments. I used this morning a quote from Ann Weems about the church. I wanted to start our morning together there because it is where we leave Paul's letter today. 
Our reading from Ephesians ends with worship, singing psalms and hymns and making melody to the Lord. And that is where Christian community begins and is nourished. It's a hard sell sometimes, especially in this day of instant communication with all your peeps and tweets and friends on Facebook and Instagram and whatever the next thing will be. You can do that without ever having to leave your bed or your room or your house. And maybe in this time of pandemic, it's particularly important for us to think about the meaning of community, how important it is for us to be community with one another. But here we are, because we know that even with all the technology at our disposal, and I'm not knocking it because I use it every day, even with all of the technology at our disposal, it is in community, in a community of faith, where we can speak the truth in love. It is here in our community of faith that we move towards a fulfillment of the will of God. You know, worship, as hard as it is right now to do apart from one another, worship is a rehearsal. In worship, we rehearse the will of God, the reality of the kingdom of God. We play at radical abandonment in the presence of God. We rehearse what it means to speak the truth in love, to truly love one another, keeping Jesus' new commandment. Our wish, worship shapes our lives. It nourishes us as individuals and as a community of faith. It recognizes our shared humanity and our shared goal the will of God. Our worship is as an act of dependence on God as we, in everything, give thanks. So there you are, a living, loving community, warts and messiness and beautiful and all. And now there you go. Go and be that community at home, at work, at play and for our needy world. Be that community in mind and spirit, even as we are called to be physically apart from one another. Amen, amen, and amen.
My friends, God has given us gifts to share. Prophetic acts and acts of service, teaching and leading, encouragement, diligence and cheerfulness, giving without strings attached. Freely then, we open our hearts and our hands and our resources to a world in need. Let's dedicate the gifts we offer to God. Gracious Lord, you have given us more mercy than we could imagine and more blessings than we deserve. Receive now these gifts as tokens of our gratitude to you, that your mercy may be multiplied and your blessings abound to embrace all those in need. Amen. Friends, I invite you to join me for a time of prayer. Let us go before the Lord. God of our lives, we thank you for this morning and this chance to worship together. And now we lift up those who are in need of your care. Servant God, we ask that you would be with those who are not seen or heard in this world because of their gender, or their age, or their race, or their poverty, or history. Open our eyes and ears to hear and see all people as yours. God of little children, be with all children wherever they live, whoever their parents are, whatever their needs, that they would all be welcomed and nourished, and able to be all you want them to be, Open our hearts and arms to welcome all your children. God of love, be with all those who live in fear. Fear of saying the wrong thing, fear of being labeled, fear of themselves, fear of others, fear of the future, and fear of you. Open us all to your endless love that it might drive out fear. Teacher God, be with us all as we struggle to make sense of your world and your word as your church, in our communities, and as your disciples. Open our minds and hearts to learn from you. God of all, Father, Son, and Spirit, hear our prayers that we have spoken and now that we will offer to you silently. Offered out of our hope, offered out of our hearts and minds and spirits. Lord, we lift up to you these names in a moment of silence, knowing that you hear us. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. God, we also lift up our friends who are in need of your loving care. We lift up Martine, Ethan, 
Sonia and Drew, Kathy and Harry, Eric, Jaina, Gabriel and Emma, Heather and Stosh, Ariana, Georgia, Colleen and Jean. Lord, we know that you are with each and every one of them. We thank you for your provision and care and your spirit being with them. And now, Lord, we pray the prayer together with one voice, the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, let us leave this place knowing that our Lord Jesus Christ has given us grace in abundance to face whatever we may have to face, to be immersed in the messiness of life, knowing that in our community we find strength and connection and hope and love. Go in that knowledge, in that hope, in that love, in that faith. And know that our Lord Jesus Christ is as close to you as every breath you take. Be of good cheer. Be joyful. Be hopeful. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Go in peace, my friends. We'll see you next week. Blessings. Blessings.